Okay, my name is Stan Zdonik, and I've only been on the faculty for 34 years, so I've got a ways to go to catch John. <laughs> you saw a picture of me as a much younger man, and uh, it's not getting any younger, so uh, we'll see. I'm here to introduce uh, Larry Harper. Uh, as some of you may know, there's been a change in the schedule, and uh, Professor Andy Yao will unfortunately not be able to join us today. He sent a message for John, which will be read during the reception. Professor Larry Harper received a BA in physics from the University of California at Berkeley in 1961 and a PhD from mathematics from the University of Oregon in 1965. He was both a postdoc and an assistant professor at Rockefeller University in New York from 1965 to 1970. He then went on to become an associate professor and professor at the University of California at Riverside. Professor Harper had 42 pa papers published in math reviews between 1964 to, 19, to 2014. The journal Theoretical Computer Science dedicated an issue to celebrating his 65th birthday in which Professor T.H. Payne inveigled him into writing an autobiographical sketch that appeared there under the title Accidental Combinatorist. Professor Harper retired from the University of California at Riverside in 2007. It's my great pleasure to introduce Larry Harper. <clears throat> I met John Savage in June of 1969 at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We were academic uh, summer employees in the communications division. We were pretty much free to do what we wanted. We quickly found that we shared a passion complexity of computation, and that our backgrounds were complementary. My specialty is combinatorics, and I had fantasized since I was a graduate student in 1963 about proving the traveling salesman's problem, which is one of the old chestnuts of combinatorics, unsolvable. That is that there is no efficient algorithm for the traveling salesman problem. My reflections on this challenge had led me to conclude that proving lower bounds on the work to solve the traveling salesman problem required a theory of computation based on a concrete model of the computer. The only theory of computation that I knew much about was Turing's, having read books by Martin Davis and Hans Hermes. I could not see how computation on a Turing machine could lead to meaningful lower bounds on the complexity of a specific problem or computation. Time for a particular computation depended on the machine. A bigger, faster machine could take less time and, uh, to run the same program. A random access machine could pre-compute the solution and store it in RAM, accessing any value in linear time. Around 1965-66, I discussed these problems with Jack Edmonds. <laughs> Jack's approach was to pick an arbitrary computer to be standard. All others would be reduced to the standard by a polynomial bounded transformation. The criterion for unsolvability with respect to Edmonds' model was super polynomial growth in the time required to solve the problem as the number of inputs goes to infinity. But then what properties of that computer do you use to get these very strong lower bounds? John, however, in 1969 had the answers to my questions. He was pulling together the essential elements of a general theory of complexity in terms of what are now called Boolean circuits. The theory had been initiated by Claude Shannon Somehow I got the same picture off the internet. <laughs> uh, Shannon, uh, in around 1949, uh, had uh, initiated a theory of complexity in terms of switching circuits, electromechanical devices, and you can actually see a switching, uh, telephone switching uh, uh, board in the background there. <coughs> Uh, switching circuits are electromechanical electro devices that were used in telephone switchboards 
and essentially all other electronic automata up to that time. <coughs> a switching circuit computed a Boolean function. The input variables were associated with switches uh, that you could throw. Uh, uh, open was zero, no, no current flowing. Uh, close is one, which uh, current flows. Two sub-circuits in series would compute the AND of the functions of the sub-circuits. In parallel, they would compute their OR. Electromechanical devices called relays could invert the current in a wire, changing zero to one and one to zero. The complexity of a circuit is the number of switches it contains, and the complexity of a Boolean function is the minimum complexity of any circuit that represents or computes it. As you can see, the subject of complexity is very complex. <laughs> and this was just the beginning. <clears throat> Shannon's main result was that almost all Boolean functions, let's see, uh, have uh, what he, uh, the complexity that he defined on the order of, uh, for a, a function of n variables on the order of two to the n over log n. Uh, a lower bound was proved by counting the number of Boolean functions of n variables, which is two to the two to the n, that's quite uh, elementary, and comparing it to the number of different switching circuits of complexity at most c, which is near uh, end of the c. Uh, the upper bound, uh, so that gave you the lower bound of two to the n over log n, and the upper bound was uh, proved by improving the, the bound given by disjunctive normal form, which is n minus one times two to the n, until it agreed with the lower bound. After 1950, Shannon's groundbreaking work disappeared without a trace in the literature of the free world. I still wonder why. Fortunately for us, it was taken up by Oleg Lupanov at, at Moscow State University. Lupanov simplified the mo model of computation to what are now called Boolean circuits. Uh, <coughs> a Boolean circuit is made up of chips. Uh, that's one up on the top there. Uh, the input variables are on the left, A, B through E. And the chips compute and the basic Boolean functions and uh, not uh, or and not um, the uh, <coughs> uh, the wires uh, taking the output of one chip to the input of another. The whole machine consists of an acyclic directed graph with inputs uh, for the variables. Uh, in in the future, I'll call them x1 up to xn because there are n of them, and a single output which was the Boolean function f of x1 through xn. The complexity of a Boolean circuit is the number of chips and the complexity of a Boolean function. So here it's uh, six. The complexity of a Boolean function is the uh, minimum number of chips in, in a circuit that uh, computes it. Um, <coughs> Lupanov generalized the Shannon bounds, upper and lower, from switching circuits uh, to fan out one uh, Boolean circuits uh, <clears throat> and got the same ensemble bounds for uh, the complexity of most Boolean functions, uh, two to the n over log n. But allowing fan out greater than one, uh, which meant that a result from any part of the computation can be re reused at a later time, was actually more uh, realistic. Uh, without having to duplicate the subcomputation. Since there are more unlimited fan out Boolean circuits of complexity uh, C infinity, then the ensemble bounds for unlimited fan out are lower on the order of 2 to the n over n. <coughs> Here's what we call the element, or I call the elementary lower bound. If a, 
uh, on a specific function. If a Boolean function Fn actually depends on all n variables, then the uh, fan, unlimited fan out uh, complexity of that Boolean function is at least n minus one. And it's rather simple to see that this is, is true. Uh, you have n or more wires coming into the machine and representing the variables, uh, x1 and x2 up to xn. And uh, if every one of them affects the outcome of the computation, then the wires must be connected to the output of the machine, which gives you f of x1 through xn. Uh, and there are c infinity chips there. So you have at least n input wires, must be which must be reduced to one output wire. Each chip can change the number of wires, but, but by at most, minus two, the number that go into the chip, plus one, the one that comes out. So the difference is minus one. Uh, <coughs> so there must be at least n minus one chips in order to make that happen. Why I like John's ideas about this. Uh, one, the model of computation was combinatorial. It was just an acyclic network. This opened up the possibility for combinatorics to provide lower bounds on complexity, extending the uh, elementary lower bound, uh, C infinity of Fn is equal to or greater than n minus one. Computations on more sophisticated models of computation, such as Turing machines, could be emulated by Boolean circuits so that any lower bound on C infinity would apply to them also. These emulations provided what John called space-time trade-offs. C infinity of Fn is equal to or less than kappa sub m, kappa sub m being a constant depending on the machine you were emulating, and S and T being the space and time required for a computation of Fn on the machine. And three, the Shannon-Lupinov bounds, uh, C infinity of Fn uh, approximately two to the n over log over n, for almost all Boolean functions of n variables showed that lower bounds for Boolean functions associated with the traveling salesman problem or other combinatorial problems had the possibility of being large, even exponential in n. <coughs> So, our, in 1970, the only literature available on Boolean circuits was in the back issues of uh, Problemi Kibernetici, the journal which Luke Lupanov and his students published. Uh, having studied Russian at Berkeley, I was able to read these articles. One of Lupanov's students, Nechiporuk, had extended the elementary lower bound on C infinity of F using the Shannon. Lupinov bound to get a lower bound of uh, n to the three uh, uh, of uh, n log n uh, on uh, c uh, fan out one complexity. Uh, I'm sorry, n squared over log n, uh, <laughs> and he defined a, a sequence of uh, artificially uh, artificial Boolean functions. Uh, uh, which, uh, uh, to which the lower bound applied. In our first paper, John and I generalized Nechiporuk's bound and applied it to the permanent mod two of an n by n matrix of zeros and ones. We were able to show that the fan out one complexity of the permanent mod two is at least n to the three halves times some constant. John and I had a great time working on that paper and uh, others over several summers at JPL. We were both entranced by the possibilities, but turning our vision into theorems turned out to be immensely difficult. We spent so much time together that our colleagues called us the odd couple. <laughs> Relishing the joke, we added Neil Simon's play to the bibliography of our first paper. <laughs>
Then all hell broke loose. In 1972, uh, IBM sponsored a conference on complexity theory at Yorktown Heights. The main event, uh, epic making really, was a lecture by Richard Karp. Uh, <laughs> Karp laid out a theory of complexity based on recursive function theory. Recursive function theory was what developed from Turing's demonstration that the halting problem is undecidable. That is uh, par partially recursive, but not recursive. So the class of partially recursive functions is strictly larger than the class of recursive functions. In fact, the halting problem is complete in the class of partially recursive functions in the sense that any partially recursive function is reducible to it. Another way to say the same thing is that if we have an oracle that can decide the halting problem, then every uh, partially recursive function is recursive with the assistance of the oracle. The basic theory of complexity had actually been laid out a year before by Stephen Cook. <clears throat> Uh, of the University of Toronto. It treated decision problems, that is, computing a sequence of Boolean functions, Pn of x equals zero or one, uh, for x, uh, an n-tuple of, ze of uh, zeros and ones. The analog of recursive functions were those uh, sequences of Boolean functions, P, as uh, Cook called them, computable on a given universal Turing machine, M, in time T, which is bounded above by a polynomial in N. As Edmonds had pointed out, it doesn't matter which universal Turing machine M is used because any other M prime can simulate the termination, the calculation of M in polynomial time. The analog of the recursively enumerable functions is the class of Boolean functions NP. So P is the analog of the class of recursive functions, the recursively enumerable functions. The analog is uh, the class NP of uh, partially, uh, or functions computable by a non-deterministic machine, N, in polynomial time. Cook then showed, so the key word there is non-deterministic. Uh, that the, essentially that the computer is allowed to make guesses in the course of the computation, and, and ver if they're verifiable. Cook then, uh, Cook then showed that the analog of the halting problem is satisfiability for Boolean polynomials in conjunctive normal form. Given such a polynomial Pn, does there exist some selection of values zero and one for the variables such that the function gives the value one. A non-deterministic machine can guess the values for those variables and then verify it in polynomial time. And uh, so its uh, satisfiability is in NP. Every other sequence of functions in NP is polynomial reducible to the satisfiability problem. So satisfiability is NP complete. Uh, yeah, I think you'll agree with me that John is the best looking of all the complexity theorists. Uh, I, I, I couldn't use the uh, picture of Jack Edmonds when he was, uh, the recent picture, because it was so scary. Uh, <laughs> Cook also showed that 3SAT and the subgraph isomorphism problem were NP-complete by reducing SAT to 3SAT and 3SAT to the subgraph isomorphism problem. So. In his Yorktown Heights lecture, Karp demonstrated that 21 other combinatorial chestnuts are also NP-complete, including chromatic number of a graph, existence of a Hamiltonian cycle, and the 
Hamiltonian cycle question is actually a special case of the traveling salesman problem, so our, my problem was included in, in this. Uh, bin packing, integer programming, etc. 21 problems in all. That lecture galvanized collective action in mathematics like nothing I have ever seen before or since. Several years later, when Gary and Johnson published their survey on NP, there were 300 NP complete problems. Now there are thousands. John and I at, at first, John and I were elated because CARP's presentation had raised the stakes for our project many times over. We had been trying to prove the traveling salesman problem uh, unsolvable. Now we had a host of other combinatorial chestnuts that are equivalent to it in the sense that either they're all solvable or all unsolvable. We applied for an NSF grant to support our project. It was funded for two years. Our goal was to improve on the elementary lower bound uh, for f depending non-trivially on n variables. We worked hard at it, but the results were amazingly paltry, uh, not what we had hoped for. <clears throat> so we considered the uh, class of Boolean functions satisfying what I call, what, what we call the P uh, sub MK property. I'm going to forget about the super n. It's always for a function having n variable inputs. Uh, such that there, uh, so it has the, the PMK property means that the function of n variables, uh, if you restrict any m variables, any m variables to constants, you get a subfunction of the other n minus m variables. And the condition was that uh, there be at least k distinct subfunctions uh, for each sele selection of those m variables. Uh, it's easy to see that k then must be equal to or less than 2 to the m and 2 to the 2 to the n minus m. What we showed uh, in our second paper was that the P12 property is equivalent to non-trivial dependence on all n variables. So uh, C infinity of F is equal to or greater than N minus 1. And this is sharp. This is the best you can do. If F satisfies the P23 property, then C infinity of F is equal to or greater than N. And that is sharp. And three, if F satisfies the P35 property, then C infinity of F is equal to or greater than 10N minus seven divided by nine. Inequality three was the first asymptotic improvement on the elementary lower bound for C infinity in the literature. In 1974, we applied uh, to NSF for a renewal of our grant, feeling that we had done state-of-the-art work and were ready to take sub-function conditions to the next level. I was very disappointed when our proposal was turned down. The review that shot it down said, what the authors propose, and by that he meant proving that P is not equal to NP, is impossible, because I am in the process of proving that the question is undecidable. The thing that most irritated me was that P not equal to NP was not the focus of our proposal and only mentioned as context. By then, our main goal had changed to getting real b lower bounds on C infinity and applying them to real problems. We regarded a lower bound of cap O of N log N as significant, cap O of N squared as realistic, uh, and anything with an exponent greater than two is fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> After some reflection, I decided I would rather go back to combinatorial optimization. My last thought on the subject was, uh, this was for, for about 40 years, let's see what this looks like in five or 10 years. It was not about the money, it was about respect. <laughs> At the 
At the, at the time, I intended to get back to work with John after the dust had settled, but life seldom goes as planned, and I never got back to complexity. Since being invited to participate here, I have looked over the voluminous literature that has accumulated in the intervening years. The research articles, surveys, and fat textbooks are very impressive. Uh, I wished I had had those when I was trying to read <laughs> Nechiporik and Lupinov uh, from Problemi Kibernetiki. Uh, <clears throat> the extension of our original problem to P not equal to NP became one of the Millennium Prize problems. A solution is now worth one million dollars. In their very nice textbook, uh, Aurora and Barak uh, state that the best lower bound for unlimited fan out complexity is now that uh, uh, equal to or greater than 5n. So uh, a whole, there have been actually a whole series of papers uh, pushing that up, but we started out at 10 ninths n, and uh, now it's up to 5n. Uh, in a stimulating survey of the possibilities for lower bounds on circuit complexity, 2008, Eric Allender asked about proving that SAT requires depth bounded circuits of size at least n to the 1.01 n. So even with additional constraints on the machines, the, uh, they've not been able to push the C infinity lower bound uh, to exponents greater than one. <laughs> and here's the latest word that I could find. It's from the uh, Stanford University's online Encyclopedia of Philosophy uh, entry on computational complexity. Uh, let's see. And they first of all mentioned that circuit complexity is still one of the tools that's given major consideration as having the possibility for showing that P is not equal to NP. Uh, in particular, articles by Rasparov and others. Uh, <laughs> so they end up saying, it thus seems reasonable to summarize the current status of P not equal to NP problem as follows. One, P is not equal to NP is widely believed to be true on the basis of convergent inductive and heuristic evidence. Two, we currently have no reason to suspect that this statement is formally independent of the mathematical theories which we accept in practice. And this, in particular, demolishes the judgment of that anonymous NSF referee. But a proof that P not equal to NP is still considered to be beyond the reach of current techniques. So, John, the project that we started on 50 years ago uh, is still as big and beautiful as it ever was. What do you say we spend some of our next 50 years going after it? <laughs> <laughs>